Hey, welcome back. This is the Geology of Placer Gold, Part 3. Basic Rock and Mineral Geology for Prospectors. Now, learning a little bit about rocks and minerals is important for a prospector. Uh, you don't have to be the world's greatest living expert or anything, but uh, knowing some basics is important. We'll talk about the basic host rocks and minerals that uh, often host gold deposits and will help you need to know what you're looking for. Uh, knowing the basics is uh, certainly going to help you become a better prospector, so come on. One doesn't need to be an expert, like I say, but a basic knowledge of rocks and minerals can be very helpful in prospecting for gold and gemstones. If you study up and, and learn what we're going to talk about here, uh, you'll know how to see the favorable minerals that will help you find other valuable minerals, things that are good indicators. That's what I'm talking about. Now, some mineral specimens are valuable just in and of themselves, so keep your eyes open. And I just want to note also that this is a simplified look at the essential rock and mineral knowledge for prospectors. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and reduce the complexity of some more technical information. I'm not trying to say I don't know all this stuff, but, uh, you know, there are little detail stuff that really the average prospector has no reason to or need to know. So what exactly is a rock? Well, rocks are simply an aggregate of minerals formed together that are minerals that are accumulated and stuck together into a single mass. Now, minerals form under various conditions, and, but when they come together to form a solid mineral or solid material, they form rocks. Some rocks are formed principally of one type of mineral, like quartzite, which is mostly quartz. It's a rock formed of compressed quartz sand. Other rocks have different minerals. Uh, one example is granite, which may contain small amounts of a dozen or more different minerals. So there's three basic rock types. Igneous, that's rocks that have been melted and flowing down the hill behind me there is a stream of red hot lava. And uh, that certainly is an igneous rock. It's melted as it's flowing. Uh, sedimentary rocks, these are rocks formed when sediment, uh, when erosion happens and rocks are weathered and they flow and you get clay and sand and and the silt and that sort of thing um, those things turn into sedimentary rocks and then metamorphic these are rocks that are changed by heat and pressure so we'll talk about igneous rocks first these are like I say rocks that have been melted at one time or another igneous extrusive rocks meaning these are rocks that come out they're extruded onto the surface they're what a lot of people would call lava um, examples of these are basalt, andesite, and rhyolite. They generally show microscopic crystals because they cool so fast. Now in this picture where I have the black little looks like tiles that are there together, this is a rock called basalt. And if basalt is um, injected in a layer and allowed to cool not quite as fast as coming out on the surface, it tends to form these irregular joints and cracks. It's a material called columnar basalt. And this is the top of a very famous uh, columnar basalt pile in California called the Devil's Post Pile. Um, igneous intrusive rocks are molten magmas that come up but have a chance to cool very slowly. So they form crystals easily visible to the eye. And you can see the, the black specks and there's white specks and, and that sort of thing in the example of the igneous intrusive rock. That's a piece of granite from California with a, a darker inclusion of a more basic rock. The uh, extrusive rocks, the crystals in them are generally microscopic. They're so small. So there's a, a big difference right there, whether they're easily visible or microscopic. Now here's some examples of igneous extrusive rocks. These are, um, they're, they're judged and classified mostly on their quartz and iron content. Yes, it, uh, the geologists take into account some other minerals, but uh, as a general concept, um, how much quartz and how much iron the rock has will determine what categories, for the most part, that it would fall into. So there's different types of igneous rocks like andesite or deosite that grade between these two extremes. Because on the, on the left-hand side, we have rhyolite, which is a quartz-rich and iron-poor. It's usually light in color. 
and on the right side we have basalt which is iron rich and quartz poor it's usually very dark in color or black now the example of basalt we have is has a lot of little holes in it as you can see and this is uh, many more holes than is typical for basalt typical for basalt may be 10 to 20 percent holes and you know 80 or 90 percent rock whereas this is probably 60 percent holes and only about 40 percent rock um, the holes come from gases that are actually dissolved in the rock and as the rock comes up to the surface and the pressure is released the gases that were in the rock deep in the earth come out and form these little bubble holes is basically what they are and uh, this particular rock um, the basalt piece is from Hawaii uh, from an eruption that's only a little over 350 years old so it actually the eruption happened in historic times now on the left we have a piece of rhyolite and you can see if you look real close there's kind of a series of lines across it um, there's kind of a flow line that flows from uh, right to left and that is it's not an optical illusion those really are uh, lines just kind of like a sedimentary rock because a lot of times rhyolite is laid down in what they call an ash flow tuff. It basically is like the explosion that happened in Mount St. Helens. And when uh, all the dust and materials from the explosion uh, come down together, they do form little layers like a sedimentary rock. And then this material, um, it congeals into a solid rock. And then you have rhyolite. And if you look at this specimen of rhyolite, you may see a few little vesicle holes like in the basalt, only instead of being mostly holes, it has just a few. Um, a couple of them have a kind of a gray material in there, and that's quartz that was formed as the rock was solidifying from gases that were in the rock. And uh, some of the specimens of, of this material, because this is from a spot near Ely, some of these vesicles or holes in the rhyolite actually contain garnets. There's places where the holes contain topaz. It's kind of an interesting little thing. And in fact, there's a couple of places where it contains a barrel, a form of barrel, and usually the barrel in these little vesicles is red, and it's an unusual thing to find a red barrel. Anyway, this is what you see with rhyolite. Now we're going to talk a little bit about phenocris, and this is a chunk of basalt, and you see that it's got more of a purplish or lavender kind of color to it, and um, that's because this specimen of basalt has been near the surface and is many thousands of years old, and it's weathered. Originally, you know, right after it uh, had erupted, it would be black like the other specimen, but uh, you'll note that this has a clear chunk in it, and sometimes magma uh, that comes near the surface uh, and doesn't come quite right out on it uh, has a chance to cool slowly near the surface for on a while before it actually gets erupted to the surface sometimes when the conditions are right during that cooling crystals will form and these are capable of being gemstones and this is how peridot and sunstone gems are formed this specimen is a bit of sunstone from the plush sunstone area in oregon now, igneous intrusive rocks, these are rocks that have a chance to cool slowly, um, are also categorized into different ones based on their coarse and iron content. And uh, there's whole classes of rocks like uh, the granite, uh, but as well as diorite or monzonite. And there are grades between the two based on their iron and quartz content. So granite at one extreme is light with you can see it's mostly light colored with just a few dark specks and then the one on the right the gabbro is just the opposite it's mostly dark colored minerals with very few with a limited number of white specks and the white specks are mostly felspar not quartz whereas the uh, granite has significant free quartz in it now here's another example from our uh, an unusual case from the uh, igneous intrusive type category it's called a pegmatite these usually form as veins or dikes and they represent very slowly cooled rocks 
they're basically the when uh, you have an igneous intrusive rock and it cools slowly the very last of what uh, is is not solidified the very last of the the material that solidifies out of this the body of igneous intrusive rock has water and other things in it and, and usually some unusual minerals including beryllium and boron and and uh, lithium and other things and these form pegmatites they have very coarse crystals instead of being little specks um, they can easily be several inches to many feet across uh, single crystals of 20 feet are not unknown in pegmatite rocks this particular sample is from a famous uh, pegmatite vein in san diego county in california called the himalaya vein that has produced all kinds of gem tourmaline and a bunch of other beautiful minerals the uh, the specimen here has some kind of translucent quartz some white opaque felspar and some kind of yellow golden kind of uh, books of muscovite mica and then the black is black uh, scoral tourmaline so on to metamorphic rocks metamorphic rocks metamorphic means changed form okay that meta is changed and morph is form um, rocks these are rocks that have been changed by heat and pressure uh, what will happen is that a mud or a siltstone will change to slate and then with more heat and pressure to schist and then finally to nice as the heat and pressure increase and basically once you get past that point with much more heat and pressure there's a rock called migmite which is kind of partly melted and um, then the rock is that you get enough heat and pressure and it just melts and then you have a, a, an igneous rock and now these metamorphic rocks are common hosts of gold and silver veins and many are of a type which is called foliated which means they naturally break into flat slabs as the picture that I've shown here you can see these are chunks that are flat and slabby um, this example is a schist and it's a metasedimentary rock meaning that it was a mudstone or siltstone claystone something like that that uh, by heat and pressure was changed to schist now the silvery piece that's in the lower right hand side is actually how the rock looks unweathered the piece that's on the middle left that has the kind of purplish color is a partly weathered piece of the same rock I mean there's no difference between the only difference between these three specimens is the amount of weathering that has happened to the different rocks so silver unweathered the lavender purpley piece is somewhat weathered and then the piece on the upper right is fairly highly weathered so it makes a lot of difference different kinds of rocks how they appear then depending on how much they've been weathered now here's a rock that is basically what's called a metavolcanic rock this is a basalt like the basalt that we saw at the beginning the black material this is a, a basalt that's been exposed to a lot of heat and pressure it's called as a general rule um, greenstone and the greenstone is found with uh, gold around the world and in fact the the four stones that I have pictured here for you are from three different continents the two on the right are from North America the upper right is from California the lower right is from a gold field in Arizona both these are all four of these are from gold fields um, the pieces on the left the upper piece on the left is from Africa from West Africa and the lower left is from Australia all of them came from gold bearing areas again it's it's a metavolcanic rock the equivalent of basalt that's been changed now one of the things I like to point out to new prospectors and to people who are just learning about rocks is not every green colored stone is this green stone a lot of prospectors have the the habit of doing that I see a green colored rock and there's lots of different rocks that can be colored green and they call the green colored rock greenstone uh, and then in fact that's why in the mo for the most part geologists have abandoned this term greenstone because it's just too generally used I mean 
is jade a green stone yeah well jade is not green stone jade is not uh, meta basalt so anyway this is an interesting rock and certainly one that's very common for hosting gold deposits now sedimentary rocks I mentioned are rocks that are formed by the weathering of other rocks uh, normally they show layers of, of uh, their deposition and this is a, a shot taken from the Grand Canyon in Arizona and you can see the, the far wall the upper part is light colored with bands of a darker red and then the uh, lower rock the red is um, has bands of lighter colored rock in it the lighter colored rock is a limestone the lower red colored rock is sandstone so you have uh, limestone with beds of sandstone in it and sandstone with a few beds of limestone in it. Um, they're most commonly uh, uh, types of rock like this include sandstones, mudstones, limestones, shale, and these types of rocks are only very rarely gold bearing. It can happen and in fact the the Carlin deposits of Nevada are largely sedimentary rocks. But for the most part, the, the, for the most a type of thing these rocks are not great hosts for gold now the geologic ages honestly this isn't something you need to know backward and forward but having a little bit of understanding about some of these and uh, what they represent are important is important because it can help you read geologic maps because generally younger rocks lie on top of older rocks of course there are some exceptions and reasons for that uh, faulting and thrusting can actually put older rocks on top of younger rocks which is it's unusual but it does happen um, younger rocks may be uh, may bury rocks that are favorable gold hosts um, and certainly in California and a lot of other places there's places where there's good gold hosting rock and it's covered over with more recent uh, lavas and basalts and that sort of thing and you know, uh, when it's buried with the hundreds of feet of other rock, there's nothing much you can do to it. But understanding where that is, you'll know that uh, probably hunting in those younger rocks that uh, bury the favorable host rock, uh, those younger rocks are probably not good places to look for gold. So getting back to mineral, the mineral side of things, what is a mineral? Well, a mineral is a solid inorganic substance with a definite chemical composition made of a single chemical element or a compound of multiple elements so this means something like gold that's a single element makes a mineral called gold and uh, something like quartz which is made of a uh, compound of silicon and oxygen that is uh, the compound uh, silicon dioxide is what is quartz so that's uh, two elements but there's other minerals that have two three four five and sometimes even more different elements although usually two three four is is pretty normal um, the chemical makeup of a mineral can vary within certain tolerance ranges uh, no minerals are 100 percent pure no gold anywhere is 100 uh, percent perfectly pure all nuggets have a certain amount of impurities in them often silver but sometimes a little copper and some other things uh, minerals formed by a natural they're a naturally occurring substance formed by geologic processes so something like a pearl or a shell from an animal that's not a naturally occurring substance formed by geological processes it those are the substances formed by animals acting on different things so um, things that are organic and and or come from animals are not minerals um, minerals are always a substance with a crystal structure formed by an ordered internal arrangement of atoms so something like opal which is a basically a silica gel is not actually technically a mineral because it doesn't have an ordered internal arrangements it's a gel okay so identifying characteristics of minerals mineral color that's the one that everybody focuses on of course because it's easy to see you just look at the mineral and you can see it's blue it's green it's red it's white um, the problem is that um, 
there are a lot of minerals that have overlapping colors. I've had people say, oh, I was up on so-and-so and I found a red mineral. What is it? Well, who knows? There's probably 50 different red minerals it might be. So there's a lot of things that are red, a lot of things that are black, a lot of things that are blue. So anyway, mineral color is not a really great, uh, by itself anyway, it's not a great identifier. Now a streak test I mentioned here, some minerals that are really dark in color, super dark brown, dark near black, super dark blue, that kind of stuff, um, it's hard to tell what color they are because they're so dark. And so what people actually do is they take a, a piece of unglazed porcelain and run, make a streak of the mineral on the porcelain. And then you get basically a powder of the mineral. And usually you can see a lot better whether the mineral it truly is black or brown or dark blue or dark green. Um, so sometimes a streak test is a, a helpful thing. Mineral hardness. Minerals have hardness um, because they're crystal arrangement. That's a useful thing that can be used to identify minerals. Part of the problem, though, with hardness is that when minerals weather, they lose some of their hardness. So that can be complex there. Crystal shape, um, that's one that's uh, often very helpful. If you know a color and a crystal shape and you know cleavage, which is how um, minerals tend to break and fracture, um, that's often sufficient to identify a mineral. Uh, luster is another thing, you know, there's um, different kinds of lusters, a metallic luster, you know, like pyrite has a metallic kind of luster, whereas quartz has a glassy kind of luster. Um, that's another thing that you can see easily. Magnetism, you know, some minerals are magnetic, and then, of course, the, the bottom line for everything is to chemically analyze the mineral to see what's in it, and then you know what the mineral makeup is. Now, field identification of minerals. Like I mentioned, weathering can make minerals hard to identify. Weathering can obscure luster, it can reduce hardness. Um, there's a lot of things weathering can do. So, uh, highly weathered minerals are harder to identify. And minerals are often converted to clays. Um, they can also be converted to other minerals. There's examples of where one mineral replaces another. So. Uh, it's very common to have malachite, which is a green copper carbonate, replace azurite, which is a blue copper carbonate. And so you find uh, specimens of malachite, the green, with the crystal structure looking like they're the blue mineral azurite. And so, um, and there's even ones that are half converted, I've seen. So the, when you have one mineral converted to another, that's called a pseudomorph. Another really common pseudomorph is a mineral called limonite, which is basically iron rust. I mean, it's natural rust um, formed after pyrite. Pyrite is an iron sulfide, and the natural process of weathering, the oxygen replaces the sulfur in the pyrite, and you end up with a cube that looks very much like a cube of pyrite, but it's no longer metallic gold in color. It's now rusty brown in color. So those are pseudomorphs. Limonite after pyrite, a very common one. A lot of times seen in uh, ores and out uh, when prospecting. Now I mentioned colors can vary quite a bit, and only rarely are colors characteristic. A lot of minerals can uh, be found in two, three, four, five they're different colors and sometimes you know a mineral can be found in pretty much every color of the rainbow lumpy or broken pieces may not show crystal shape very well uh, and minerals from the same family can be tough to separate uh, you know garnets for instance are belong to the same family but there's several different minerals that are considered garnets and uh, it can be tough to separate one garnet fan one garnet member from the family unless you do a chemical analysis and know what's there. So field identification is possible in most cases, but it's not always super easy. So here we're taking a look at some of the different characteristics that we just mentioned. Each mineral has its own characteristic hardness. Now on the left we have a diamond, and on the right a ruby. And diamond is harder than ruby, so if you 
took the diamond and tried to scratch the ruby, the ruby would scratch. The diamond would, would win. And so uh, they're, they make little hardness t test kits that you can actually buy. And they have different specimens of different minerals. And uh, you can try different minerals of different hardnesses to see the mineral you're trying to identify to see what its hardness is. Now, crystal shape, boy, when you can see it, uh, can be really helpful. These are all examples of quartz crystals. And look, look at how they look the same. In the upper left-hand one is a drawing, but the other three are examples of real quartz crystals. And you can see that the drawing and all the real crystals have the same kind of shape. So prospectors learn really quick when they see this shape and this kind of arrangement um, that you know you're looking at a quartz crystal. Here's another crystal shape. This is a crystal shape for corundum, which is ruby and sapphires corundum. And you'll note that it has a hexagonal or six-sided crystal structure. And uh, the crystals all tend to look very similar, at least related. You can see that that structure is, is characteristic, just like with the quartz. So let's take a look at some uh, common minerals that we, we would you might well uh, uh, see out in the field. Of course, quartz. One of the things about quartz and why it's so common is the two most common elements in the Earth's crust are number one, oxygen, and number two, silicon. And when you put the two of them together, you get quartz. So you can see on the upper left, two quartz crystals that have that characteristic shape. The purple, that's amethyst. Amethyst is a form of quartz. And if you were able to get in there and look at those quartz crystals, the amethyst, you would see that it has a very similar uh, shape and structure to the other quartz crystals. It's just the amethyst in this particular example, they're, the crystals are stubby. They're short and stout instead of longer. Now on the lower right is a white vein quartz, which is, you see it in a lot of places when you're out prospecting. And then on the lower uh, left is a big log of petrified wood. And the petrified wood is mostly uh, quartz colored by some iron minerals. Here's some more quartz examples. The upper left one is gold bearing quartz. That's, that's gold in there, as you can see in the white quartz. Um, down on the left below is a rose quartz, a pinky color. And the upper right is what they call a Japan Law Twin. Uh, quartz sometimes grows together in this uh, 90 degree right angle kind of a formation where the two crystals grow and they call that a Japan Law Twin. It's a twinning of the quartz crystal. And then in the lower left is some beautiful examples of fire agate. Also quartz. Now I mentioned that uh, Sometimes one mineral or one element can make up a mineral, and this is, of course, gold. Now, you can see that uh, here's pyrite, which is an iron sulfide, something that people sometimes mistake for gold because it does have a metallic kind of yellow color. But you'll note it definitely has a greener cast. I'm going to go back to the gold. Look how warm the yellow is of that. Even the upper left color, which is the uh, the wiry stuff, is it's a little got a little higher silver content, and that's why it's lighter. It still is warmer than the greenish color of pyrite. Um, experienced prospectors learn pretty quick to see this slight color difference. And here's here's a, an example where if you have unweathered pyrite, um, you can pretty well see that uh, that it's it's probably pyrite and not gold. The other thing, too, about pyrite is that it forms this cubic shape. The cube of pyrite with the striations across it, the lines, is pretty characteristic for pyrite. And it's a good way of identifying it. The striations and the cubes will hold through even on pseudomorphs. When the limonite replaces the, the pyrite, it'll preserve even the not just the square shape, but the lines across the face. Chalcopyrite is an important mineral um, that uh, is an important ore of copper. In fact, it's probably the biggest source of copper on the planet 
Um, it's the primary mineral of a lot of different copper mines. So chalcopyrite. You can see that it's compared to regular pyrite, it's more brassy, more yellow. In fact, you know, just from a color standpoint, you might more easily uh, mistake chalcopyrite for gold than regular pyrite for gold. Arsenopyrite is similar to pyrite, but it's far more silvery in color due to the high arsenic content. And yeah, this is a rock you don't want to put in your mouth. I mean, licking it is not going to instantly kill you, but uh, how much arsenic do you want to eat? And I would say none, thank you. Uh, felspars are a very common rock forming mineral. There's a lot of different ones. Um, micro, microcline with, uh, mic or microline with uh, qu quartz uh, are two of the most common rock forming minerals, common in granites and, and that sort of thing. Labradorite is another uh, common felspar. The blue green uh, sample is a material called amazonite, which is sometimes used as a gem or used for mineral specimens. It's because it's attractive in color. Micas are another common rock forming mineral. Uh, they tend to break into flat sheets and, and you can break these into thin sheets that are uh, literally so thin that they're transparent and, and as thin as a piece of paper or thinner. The uh, two on the left are muscovite and are both from pegmatites, the big sheets there. And actually they used to um, harvest those sheets to make uh, windows that they could put in high temperature places because uh, the mica will endure temperatures higher than what almost any glass can endure. On the right, the upper one, the black colored uh, mica is biotite, but both biotite and muscovite are common rock minerals. And then the lavender purple on the lower right, that is lapidolite, which is a lithium mica and actually is an ore of the mineral lithium. Okay, the garnet family of minerals. Another family. Um, and again, hard to separate. There's a number of different types of, of garnet. Um, you'll note the orangey kind of garnet in the upper right and lower left. They seem to be of about the same color, and yet they're two different garnet minerals. The upper right is mostly grossular. The lower left is mostly spessartine. And uh, the two in, in the opposite corners, the lower left and the upper right um, are both, even though one is black and the other is green, those are the same garnet. So color is not a good way to determine what member of a garnet family. In fact, honestly, for the most case, determining what member of the garnet family you have, you almost have to do a chemical identification. Galena is the most important ore of the, of the metal lead. It uh, is found in a lot of different kinds of ore deposits. It also forms cubes like pyrite does, only these uh, will easily break into more cubes. Each cube face is also a cleavage, and then uh, they're much grayer, even grayer than uh, the more silvery arsenopyrite. Fluorite comes in a just a almost a, a rainbow of colors from blues and purples to yellows and greens and even reds once in a while. So fluorite is a common mineral found in a lot of veins. It's uh, calcium fluoride and, and it's the source of uh, uh, fluoride in your toothpaste. Uh, calcite is another common mineral found in a lot of veins and uh, it has this optical property that you can see in the lower left where it splits the beam and you can literally see double by looking through a piece of calcite. Comes in a, a wide variety of colors. A lot of it's uh, white or clear, but it can be all sorts of different colors. Tourmaline, a very famous gemstone. I showed you the piece of pegmatite earlier. That's from a, a pegmatite that's produced just tons of, of tourmaline. And uh, here's some pretty examples of tourmaline crystals. They tend to have these long striations along the length of the crystal. They also, as you can kind of see in the upper 
a left. They have kind of a triangular, but it's a bulgy triangle. It's like not a straight triangle, but the sides bulge out. That's a, a very common thing to see in tourmaline crystals is that bulged three-sided uh, shape. It comes in a, a, just a rainbow of colors. Turquoise, uh, a gemstone that I'm fond of, uh, comes in various shades of blues and greens and is found in arid areas, in, in desert type areas. Um, people tend to mix it up with a mineral called chrysocolla. And uh, it's chrysocolla is a very similar color. It, it's also a copper mineral. Both of these are copper bearing minerals. Chrysocolla has about the same percentage of copper. And so um, they get mixed up sometimes. Turquoise is a copper aluminum phosphate, whereas chrysocolla is a copper silicate. Now, what about all these rocks and minerals? I mean, literally, there are hundreds of recognized types of rocks and thousands of different minerals. You know, what if I run into one of them? Well, you know, I can only cover a small selection of the basics of minerals in this video. And a good handbook is important to have once you get the basics down pat. You can take the handbook with you. And look, I use a handbook too. I can't remember a couple thousand different minerals. Seriously. There are a number of different handbooks, and this one is my handbook for field identification. It's a good, good little book if you ever wonder about a mineral and you want to find out. All right, let's talk about faults and fault zones and how they relate to gold deposits. Most gold deposits are emplaced by circulating hot and mineralized waters. Okay? Hot mineralized waters coming up from deep in the earth. And uh, in order for the water to circulate, it needs space to circulate. It needs some kind of conduit. Solid rock doesn't make a very good conduit for circulation. So fault zones break through the rock and allow openings so that the hot water can circulate and move upward and deposit gold. This is why many veins are deposited in and related to fault zones. Now, rock contacts and dikes are similar in the same way. Um, the contact of two different rocks is often an area that can be a conduit for hot mineralized waters. And in fact, dikes are often inserted along a fault zone and then uh, later, the mineralization comes in along the walls of the dike, and you get mineralization either in the dike or adjoining to the dike, um, because, again, there's a, a conduit for hot mineralized gold-bearing waters to form. So faults and contact zones are often not just one single crack or one single break in the earth, but a series of parallel fractures, simply because the earth bends and twists and, and fractures uh, tend to, to go in, in different directions, but they, they stay generally parallel, but uh, it's not just one fracture and one thing, which is why you commonly, veins have a parallel sub-veins and uh, sometimes even veins out on one side of the, the main vein or one or another can be pretty valuable. The, the parallel veins can be pretty valuable. Um, but because of these parallel systems, it's very possible that the, um, the quartz may all be in one fracture or mostly in one fracture, but the gold be in a similar or but different fracture. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that and show that in a minute, a real life example. So remember, um, even with gold bearing fault zones and that sort of thing, it doesn't have to be right on the fault zone, but maybe near on one side or the other. Now, favorable rock types. This is an important idea that I really want to stress. Uh, the concept of favorable rock types is really important in many districts, be it you know California, Nevada, or wherever across the planet. Um, you have a situation where one type of rock, or maybe two, but usually just one are uh, the host for the goal in that area. And um, once you recognize what that favorable host is, you can look for other occurrences of that favorable host nearby. Now, 
I wish I could tell you one type of rock that's always the favorable host, but it just isn't that simple. There are favorable rocks in both California and Nevada and other states, but they tend to be different in one district as another. Now, sometimes you'll find regions where the favorable host rock is the same across the region, um, but that's not necessarily the case. So um, California has its own types of areas and in some places the host rock is one and other places the host rock is different. Same for Nevada. Um, Alaska has a lot of places where the host rock is something that's near, which is basically the outer shell of a, a granitic or similar types of igneous intrusive uh, rocks. Around the shell, the outer part of those igneous intrusive rocks is the favorable host in a lot of places in Alaska and a few places in Montana and some other locations as well. The important thing is to learn what works in your area. Now, it's very common, and not always the case, but very common that the favorable host rock is a foliated metamorphic rock. Like those rocks I showed you in the metamorphic slide in the beginning, rocks that break into flat slabs. In a study of 17 of the world's most important plaza regions, 17 of 17 were associated with rocks like schist, slate, phyllite, a phyllite, um, that naturally break into these flat slabby pieces. While these are common gold bearing rocks, there are plenty of exceptions. So like I say, learn what's the favorable type in the area you are prospecting. And a lot of times geology books or um, books by the Bureau of Mines in your area will tell you what the favorable host rock is. Now I mentioned rocks that break into flat slabs. Here's just a picture of the, the ground in Nevada in a gold bearing area, well known area that a lot of uh, uh, people with metal detectors go and hunt nuggets and I certainly have found nuggets in this area as well. And you can see all these rocks that break down into these flat slabby pieces. There's a lot of different areas where this flat slabby type of rock, be it slate or schist or phyllite or something else, is uh, the host rock for the gold deposits. Now this is actually in Australia, and this is my example of parallel areas. You can see in the back, there's white rock in, in the near background, uh, piles of white rock. That's a big quartz vein that outcrops through there. And yet when we went there, there was no gold in among the quartz. But out where I'm standing, out 50 or 100 yards from the quartz vein, there was all kinds of nuggets. Now this is a weathered greenstone and you can note that none of this looks like the greenstone that I showed you in the pictures because this is all highly weathered. And so a weathered greenstone will look different. Some of these rocks, I think if you broke them open, you might get some material that looks sort of like that uh, greenstone I showed you in the beginning. But Here's a stone that's green stone and it's not green at all. Um, but the, the gold was in a parallel zone, parallel to the, the quartz vein. And you can see in the foreground, there's little areas where the rocks have been pushed aside and little open patches created. Every one of those little open patches yielded a nugget. And the guy who first found this, I think he found over 30 ounces of gold um, initially. So and he took it out with a metal detector. Gold nuggets, and like I say, gold nuggets occur in groups. You know, it, it, this was a really nice patch, and even though I was here just taking out the last crumbs, I think I still got a quarter of an ounce or so out of this. Uh, if you find one nugget, because the geologically geologic conditions usually extend over an area, you're likely to find other nuggets nearby. Um, like I say, this is a weathered greenstone. And it uh, was the right conditions, and so there were a number of nuggets in a comparatively small area. So prospecting on the periphery of known districts, and in fact that patch in Australia was kind of on the periphery of a, a known area. And going out, and basically when you know what the favorable rock type is, you can go explore areas that are near, but right not right 
but not right smack in the middle of known deposits. It's actually a very powerful strategy for finding overlooked gold. Um, people tend to look right in the heart of a district, but if uh, the favorable rock type is a shished, you can look nearby in nearby areas within half a mile or a mile or even two miles um, for similar types of deposits, similar types of shished, and the, that shished over there, a couple mile or two away, may well have good gold in it. So um, prospecting at the periphery of known districts where you know the favorable rock type or favorable fault zone or contact um, is a powerful strategy for finding overlooked gold. So using the placer geology basics you learned in part one of this series, the research skills you learned in part two, and the information about favorable host rocks and how to recognize them in this part three, you can put yourself on to good gold. And even small areas that were found by the old timers but only lightly worked can be productive to modern day prospectors. So that's the end of this series. Um, I want to uh, also note that um, what you know makes a difference. So knowing and understanding how gold forms uh, how to read geologic maps and read reports can be very useful. Don't be afraid to do the homework and put in the time to figure out new places to prospect. Use the knowledge you have and then get out there and explore. Um, I am going to come up with a new uh, series. We've got uh, Geology of Hard Rock Gold. That's going to be out in a week or so. We'll have some other stuff in between that. Um, I also, also want to point out my book, so for similar information and more detailed than what we've just had in this presentation, if you want to really delve into it and, uh, and do your homework and learn even more, well, here's the book that you, you need to get to do that. Um, it basically has all the information you need to find your own gold. It's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know about prospecting, from panning and sluicing, metal detecting, dry wash, gold geology, how to read uh geologic maps, the whole nine yards. It's all in this book. It's 350 plus pages long, so there's a lot of material here. And it's available now on Amazon. Um, if you look, at, just go on Amazon and put in Fistful of Gold by Chris Roth, I guarantee you'll find it. I also have a, a website with a lot of other information on it, uh, different projects, um, stories and uh, adventures and a lot of useful reference information about including locations of where to find gold. It's at nevadaoutbackgems.com prospect slash chrisprospect.htm. That's the URL for it. And finally, if you like this presentation and you want to learn more about finding your own gold, well, I've, I've got more gold, silver, and gemstones coming up. And these are going to be both slide presentations like this and live action videos out in the field. So click on the subscribe button and then click the notification bell and YouTube will let you know when I publish new stuff. Hit the like button as well and feel free to ask questions or com give comments in the uh, comments section below. And so this is the finish and best of luck to all of you in your prospecting. I hope you find a lot of great gold.